Hi everyone, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Detective Coco Chamomile. <laughs> yes, Detective. <laughs> How are you doing tonight, Coco? Oh gosh, I'm actually a little... By the way, I'm still doing Sober October, and when this episode yes, airs, it's me too. October. Um, so I'm doing very sober. Yeah, same, same. <laughs> So very, so very aware of I am, myself. I yes, that very that, very that. O- aware of how you cope with things, sober. Aware of all of the emotions um, that we normally suppress with either alcohol and or weed. Yes, exactly. It's funny how people have told me this month. They're like, because uh, there's like negative drama happening in Portland, and mm-hmm. um, people are like, "How are you dealing with that sober?" I'm like responsibly <laughs> <laughs> seriously it came up yesterday when i was at the bar yeah like you do- responsibly yeah <laughs> there's no other way to deal with it because yeah you have healthy coping mechanisms mm-hmm. because like you can tell yourself all your mantras like don't sweat the small stuff like remembering the you know the four agreements and yeah like, just processing through trauma and things that are negative and then like before you post that Facebook post at 11.47 p.m. because you're drunk and you just want your feelings to be Mm. heard. Yeah. (laughs) Or you can just, in a manic episode, delete all your social media like I do and have everyone guessing about who you are and what you do. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gosh. My mom's like, are they okay? (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm still on Instagram, so follow me there. You'll see my resin pours that I've been doing. I've been making resin jewelry it's a lot of fun i have been doing nothing artistic <laughs> uh, no, my job my job is actually kicking my butt recently i've yeah. been all over the map recently and um drag is kind of coming back not full swing of course um there we even though we're not going to deliver the news here because it hasn't been announced publicly yet um we went to a town hall about one of the bars that we work at to hear, yes. um, hear some news and it kind of changed the game a little bit and Good. and so we're just like we're just kind of going through those motions because like with me and Donna we want to scale back from drag at the level that we're doing. Oh, I forgot to ask Donna, what are you wearing? Oh, I'm dressed up as like the scariest zombie I could think of, um, it, <laughs> Kellyanne Conway. I'm dressed as Kellyanne Conway. <laughs> oh, that's uh, why the hair is so stringy. Yeah, very stringy. Yeah, I, get it. Yeah, like, I it, added it, the lines yeah. onto my makeup tonight. Sense it poked me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a teenage daughter that uh, really hates me and posts TikToks about how she's voting for Biden. Yeah, fair. Um, Gosh, so, wow, you really yeah. went in on this concept. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I character studied. <laughs> Um, I'm dressed as April O'Neil, the fat version from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but like the oh. cartoon version, uh-huh. not the one that Megan Fox played. That's yeah. not really, that didn't fit um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with my concept. So yes, I am in like this yellow slash orange jumper, depending on whatever TV show you're watching or your TV quality. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it does flash and change. I'm like the blue and green dress that was oh, on the internet. Yeah, that's high fashion. Yeah, high fashion. Um, and yeah. of course, um, I am just doing this slide swoop ponytail uh-huh. just to mess with the kids because she never wore that damn i feel so underdressed <laughs> <laughs> i'm dressed as this monster and you're looking so cute over here i know like you can hear the when my pants yeah together. yeah great. because as our listeners know we have to be in drag to record this we are just done up to the nines to every time the nines. we really should start posting photos of this look sometime in the future though yeah yeah sometime in the future we'll get around to it never <laughs> <laughs> So we're continuing on with our true crime series that we're doing for the month of Spooky Ooky Halloween. Uh, On top of the fact that if you haven't heard last week's episode, um, we're going to take literally one second pause so you can pause this episode. Then you can go listen to Donna's true crime podcast that she did last week. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we'll wait for you. Yeah, go listen. And we're back. back. Okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay. So Coco, I haven't, I'm going into this completely blind like you did with mine last week. So, um, let's get to telling the story. Okay. And I'm so, um, like we prefaced with Donna's episode last week, remember that these stories are serious. Um, we are not trying to make light of them. I do giggle when I'm nervous. <laughs> so, yeah. um, it's not that I'm laughing at tragedy um, yeah. by any means. But so just um, so this is the part of the podcast where, you know, if you are sensitive to crimes against queer people and black people and things like that. And I mm-hmm. will go into details about some of the things because it adds to the story and the suspense of it. Um, yeah. This would be the time for you to tune out. Listener discretion is advised. 
listener discretion is advised. Okay, so this is um, the case of the disappearance of Marco McMillan. Hmm. So our story takes place in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Um, Mississippi again. Yeah, I, I don't know what I don't know. In 2013, mm-hmm. uh, Marco McMillan was a community oriented young black man. Mm-hmm. Um, he was 34 years old, and I don't know why that's interesting to me, but I'm also 34 right now, listeners. Mm. So and community oriented. I know. I don't know. I just I fell upon this case, by the way. Huh. <laughs> so, um, though he um, did do the one thing that most openly out black men don't do, he was running for mayor. Actually. Oh, okay. Um, but before that bid, he actually worked as the executive assistant to the president at Alabama A&M University and served as the executive director of Phi Beta Sigma, which is the black fraternal organization headquarters, which allowed him access to the halls of Congress. Hmm. Um, okay. Yeah. Dang. And he, he even on his social media had a photo of President Obama and Bill Clinton. Dang. Yeah. Very accomplished. Yeah. Just crazy. Um, yeah. I tried to actually find his social media, but I wasn't able to pick it up. I probably mm-hmm. could have found it in like the Wayback Machine or something. Yeah. Um, I want to take note that he was the first openly gay man to be vi- a viable candidate for public office in Mississippi. Hmm. He was also the CEO of MWM and Associates, a firm that provided consulting to nonprofit organizations. Hmm. So just all around, just a really great person. Yeah. So, like most leaders, Marco thought it would be great to sign up for every civic organization he could get behind. Seriously, looking at his resume, some notable ones were the NAACP mm-hmm. and Community Bridge Builders. So, on the night of February 25th, 2013, at around 10 o'clock p.m., uh, Marco told his mother and stepfather that he was going to move some cars out of the driveway. Yeah. Um, but then, according to Marco's stepfather, Amos, Amos, I believe, mm-hmm. around midnight, he noticed that Marco hadn't yet returned from something that should have only taken, like, any time at all. Yeah. Um, however, it turned out to not be as malicious as Marco's stepfather may have originally thought, though later he realized that he would never see Marco again. Hmm. Honestly, at this point, I can't blame him. He's 34. He doesn't really have to check in with his yeah. parents when you think about it. Um, but it does it does seem odd that he was going to move cars and then just never return. Yeah, yeah. So the next day, his mother, Patricia Unger, I believe her name is pronounced, a special ed teacher at the Quitman County School District, um, would get the notice that no parent would ever want to hear. Um, Her son's car had been involved in an accident. Hmm. Um, But Marco was actually nowhere to be found. Hmm. Um, Lawrence Reed, 22 years old, who worked at a Domino's Pizza, was actually driving her son's SUV when it crashed. Um breaking his ribs and a collar and his collarbone Hmm. but little did we know that at the at the time in the story this accident wasn't like kind of all it appeared to be lawrence was discovered by a friend at 8 20 in the morning on that day even though they even though they couldn't quite figure out the exact chain of events Mm -hmm. um uh this is kind of what led to like lawrence being a person of interest interesting Lawrence lived in a little more than half a mile away from Marco with his friend Camilla Evans and her partner, Derek Crump. But Lawrence's connection to Marco just kind of wasn't known yet. Mm -hmm. And at this point, Patricia, his mom, was understandably distraught. Um, It was, like, really on the go. She wanted to find her son. Yeah. Point blank period. She didn't really care about the car. Uh, And Patricia, she's also hearing hearing impaired, which I just thought was really an interesting anecdote there, Mm -hmm. learned from law enforcement that the search was underway she contacted her friends and her family, pretty much anyone who would have listened, she contacted. Hmm. Um, and he was pretty well known. I mean, yeah. he was like a mayoral candidate. Running for public office, yeah, so people knew of him. Exactly. So at this point, um, they they held a vigil at the New Jerusalem, Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church. And according to Gail Moore, the choir director, the sheriff called her at the church and asked her to get everyone on the intercom and tell them that at that night, nobody had still been found. Hmm. And at this point in the story, we like to remember that statistically speaking, we all know that the longer time someone goes missing, the more likely it is that you're going to be looking for a body and not a person. Yeah, you're going to be looking for not, not a person. And this person was 30. They're not a kid. Yeah. Um, they're 34 years old. Obviously, like, they would have known that their parents were worried at this point. So, obviously, it's starting to look bleaker and bleaker and bleaker. Yeah. On top of the fact that a strange man 
crashed your son's car. Yeah. Like, so... So, so the strange man was found driving the car, correct? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then with Marco being nowhere to be found. Yeah. So, when he crashed the car, obviously, Lawrence crashed the car. Uh-huh. And Marco was just nowhere to be found. Interesting. The next day, as we know, as time goes on in these cases, the family received some news that they had been dreading. But... At the time, the police were trying to keep them hopeful. Mm. So um, they actually decided to keep pushing the police to find more information to see what happened to their son. Mm -hmm. And so at this time, um, I need to ask Donna real quick here before we continue on. How are you doing this evening? Oh, you know, I will let you know after this brief commercial break. Hey all you beauties, this is Manhattan Brown, Eugene's bearded lady, with a special message. Do you love podcasting queers, queer issues and themes? Well check out Queer With Attitude on your podcast app for a new obsession that focuses on tearing down the societal norms in the LGBTQIA plus community with weekly guests, creative writing, and a special cocktail of the week designed by mixologist Brian Peterson. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and other podcasting apps, or you can check us out at anchor.fm backslash queerwithattitude to see where to find us and to become a monthly sponsor. Join the queer revolution to educate, create, and inspire. It's a podcast with Coco and Donna Telepodcast. Tune into what they tell you podcast Check it out. with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. Check it out. Well, Coco, I am extremely intrigued because we have a very strange set of circumstances for this case. Um, a stranger driving this woman's car and um, the son being completely missing. Yeah. And let alone the son being a public figure. Yeah. Um, Let's get into it and figure out where it goes from here. Yeah. So the next day, and as we know, as time goes on with these cases, um, the family received the news that they were dreading. Yeah. Marco's body had been found and police indicated that they recovered the body next to a levee between the communities of Sherard and Reina Lara. Sorry if I pronounced those wrong listeners. Mm -hmm. And the spot was completely isolated. A steep Mm -hmm. embankment of pasture dropped down to the barbed wire fence that went along the water, and right there is where the body was found underneath the wire. Hmm. According to the Washington Post, Cahoma County Medical Examiner Scotty Meredith went to see Patricia at her house to have her identify her son. Scotty said, um, Scotty kind of relayed this information that Marco's body showed evidence of burn marks, Hmm. bruising, and being dragged. Hmm. And this immediately takes me back to one of those famous cases, um, like back in the day when you would hear about like black men being drugged behind cars and stuff like that. Yeah. And like for miles at a time. And that's when I first read that, that's immediately what I was brought to. I was like, oh, I wonder if it was one of those hate crimes. What if it was like, and the thing is, there is an intersection even in the awfulness of being black and queer. Mm -hmm. Like I sometimes joke with my friends where I'm like, is it, does this person hate me because I'm black or do they hate me because I'm queer? We got to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as with any case, but especially a high profile case like this, the family became increasingly impatient and wanted, as would anyone who would want to know what happened to a member of their family, but, Mm -hmm. um, they weren't the only ones. Like, can you imagine the first openly out black man who was running for public office? This case was getting lots and lots of media attention because of it. Um, the family waited three days and then released a statement saying that Marco had been dragged beaten dragged and burned and that his death could not have been a random act of violence because they just were getting tired of waiting on the police yeah like they just didn't want to wait around on them any longer Mm -hmm. so let's jump a little further um it turns out what we found out from witnesses uh that marco obviously went out because he didn't return home after removing the cars and according to a friend uh lawrence reed and marco were planning on going to a party in a neighboring town Hmm. Um, at first, and at first, you know, this doesn't really seem odd. I mean, they're no. older and it's late. It's fine. It's 10 p.m. Um, 
Though I have actually had some difficulty, like in my research online, finding out the nature of the relationship between Lawrence Mm -hmm. and Marco. And at this point, I do want to make mention that there was an important distinction. Marco's mother released a statement um, saying that Marco was not openly out. She actually, um, because everybody kept saying the first openly out, and she actually went on record saying that he wasn't open. It wasn't a secret, but it's not like he went on... Like, that wasn't part of his nature. It wasn't part of also <clears throat> probably his um, identity when he was campaigning. Yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't using that as, like, an identifier for him as a candidate. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, during the same time, a little more than half a mile away, Camilla, which, remember, um, that's who Lawrence lived with. Yes. Um, would go on record saying that there was a rumor going around that Lawrence killed a man in a hate crime. Hmm. Um, but it was just a rumor at the time. Um, so according to the Washington Post article, uh, Scotty Meredith, remember the medical examiner, said the allegations were blown, w- blown way out of proportion. Mm-hmm. Scotty said Marco's body had been drugged, um, mm-hmm. but from what appears to have been a short distance. So it wasn't mm-hmm. like he was pulled behind a car for like yeah. miles. It was just a short distance. Mm-hmm. And by someone carrying Marco underneath their arms. Hmm. Um, the bruising was very minimal. And beyond that, Scotty would say little, except that the autopsy would bring more to light. Hmm. Um, but still the rumors kept swirling around and the fingers kept pointing towards Lawrence Reed. Yeah. For obvious reasons. He was the last person <laughs> that he was seen with. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, he had to know something and he was the only one driving Marco's car. Yeah. Um, more to the point, even though people thought something may have been happening between Marco and Lawrence, um, like romantically, Lawrence mm-hmm. had a girlfriend twice his age. Hmm. So um, he's 22. His gorf- girlfriend was roughly around 40 something. Hmm. Interesting. Um, uh, the only weird connection was that a friend, and I believe it's um, that Derek Crump guy, yeah, said uh, that he one time saw Lawrence getting out of Marco's car, not on this night in question, just but like in previously, the past, yeah, in the past. And Lawrence would say that Marco was just lost, and that he was helping him find his way around. And hmm. that just does seem a little odd since Marco was dropping Lawrence off. Yeah, it like, doesn't add up. <laughs> so, oh yeah, he was lost. But wait, don't you want to help him get somewhere? Like, yeah. why were you in his car? That doesn't make any sense. Um, so, officially, peace, police would identify Lawrence as a person of interest, obviously. Mm-hmm. And person of interest, and I just want to clarify for our readers who are not into true crime like me and Donna tend to be. Mm-hmm. A person of interest is a term used by the U.S. law enforcement when identifying someone involved in a crime investigation mm-hmm. who has not been arrested or formally accused of a crime. Mm-hmm. Now, and that's just an important distinction because it didn't mean at this point that Lawrence um, was guilty in any capacity. Just yeah. They were looking at it. Literally, it, it means what it means. It's yes. just the person who they're interested in. Um, <clears throat> but of course... Lawrence would later be arrested. Mm-hmm. Rumors were swirling in Clarkstone, Mississippi, that Lawrence and Marco may have actually been in a DL relationship. Uh, Donna, do you want to explain to the kids what a DL yes, relationship is? Yes, DL stands for down low. And that's basically uh, someone who is closeted and hiding or concealing the fact that they have same-sex attraction and same-sex relations. Yeah. And so... and. It's actually very common in black communities for DL relationships to exist, Mm -hmm. especially in smaller cities and in smaller communities and towns. Um, And it's and I know some of you out there, our listeners are probably like, but he had it. But Lawrence had a girlfriend. Um, DL usually actually means you may actually be dating someone. You could be dating someone else. Yeah, you could be living a straight lifestyle out to Mm -hmm. the public. But secretly on the down low, you have a relationship because that's. You know, you have those urges and those desires as someone who is closeted. Yeah, and it's and it's honestly because we just haven't built um, a healthy environment for people to feel like they can come out in the queer community and in sorry in the straight community or even in the black community. Mm-hmm. Like we really do need to do a better job. Yeah, well, I mean, especially in Mississippi. Yeah, too. absolutely, Mississippi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's what happened, according to Lawrence. Um, jumping to the end of the horrible tale. Uh, Mm -hmm. while Lawrence was in the hospital recovering from the car accident. And that's why I I don't actually know how he got to the hospital. He either went there himself or, like, the police took him there. But anyway, the police caught up with him at the hospital, obviously, because he was involved in the car accident. Yeah. So while Lawrence was in the hospital recovering from the car accident, he saw the car crash 
flash on TV, like on the news. Uh huh. And he knew it was only a matter of time before he was caught. Yeah. Uh, the sheriff's deputy, Joseph Wilde, um, that was watching Lawrence, took his confession. According to Lawrence, um, at this time mm-hmm. in the hospital, he strangled Marco with a wallet chain and then tossed him in the back of the SUV. He heard Marco begin to come to and he panicked. He pulled over by some standing water and dunked his head in to make sure he was dead. At this time, Lawrence put Marco back in the vehicle and headed back towards Clarksdale, hmm. is what he um, confessed to the officer okay. who, read him, who read him his rights and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but before this, though, um, before all of this happened, they were seen um, on a video camera together at a convenience store. Okay. So there was proof that they were together at yeah. that specific time. Yeah. And as the story begins to unfold, more information came to light. Apparently, while Marco and Lawrence were driving to a party in Quitman County, Marco drove down a rural road. During this time, the two proceeded to smoke marijuana and consume alcohol. Hmm. Lawrence stated that Marco watched pornographic material on his phone and masturbated. Marco then asked Lawrence what he did sexually with his lady partners. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Marco allegedly made a pass at Lawrence, or as Lawrence would later say, Marco tried to rape him. In court, Lawrence would claim self-defense, saying that Marco made sexual advances after driving him down a dark, deserted road. Hmm. Lawrence said that Marco pulled on his shirt, and he didn't know what was going, what he was going to do to him, but then he also testified that he blacked out. Lawrence said he blacked out before... Um, blacked out from fear and anger over Mark Marco's sexual advances. Um, he quoted him saying, I don't know where or how I grabbed the chain. Lawrence testified. Hmm. Um, he said his intent was just to hit him In a recorded confession. Lawrence told investigators that he thought Marco was still alive. So he pushed his face into standing water. Lawrence would call his girlfriend Dampier, which is a, Weird name. Mm, um, and it sounds t- Cajun. <laughs> it sounds, yeah, it does actually. Yeah, and tell her that he, she told his girlfriend that he killed Marco. He told her on the phone. Hmm. Uh, Lawrence would then drive home to change, then buy gas at a gas station. Lawrence would then try and burn Marco's phone, um, but he couldn't. Uh, uh, so he couldn't be found. So Marco mm. couldn't be found. Then Lawrence drove even further to an isolated area. Lawrence would then pour gasoline on Marco's body and set him on fire. Hmm. Lawrence would then go to his girlfriend's house and was told to leave twice. And when he left the second time is when he got into the car accident. Hmm. So let's actually recount what happened. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So Lawrence and Marco were going to a party. Uh-huh. Um, they went to a gas station where they were caught on camera or a convenience store where they're caught on camera. Marco would then drive them to a secluded area. Mm -hmm. Marco would show Lawrence porn on his phone and ask him what he was into. Lawrence would freak out and strangle Marco with his wallet chain. Lawrence would then begin to drive away in Marco's car, but after realizing that Marco was still alive, he would then pull him over to drown him. From there, Lawrence would go home to change. He did. He went home to change after drowning him. Hmm. Um, He went to change to get all, like, to get everything off of him as quickly as possible. And with a dead Marco in the back of the car, he would stop by a convenience store to buy gasoline so he could burn the phone. Yeah. Originally is what his intent was. He would then burn the um, phone, but when that wouldn't work, he actually chucked the phone out the window. Hmm. Then he figured he would try to burn the body, and the body didn't fully ignite. Um, yeah. He expected it to live. I don't know what he was expecting, but he lit him on fire, but it just went out. Yeah. And so he hid the body underneath some wire. Hmm. Is kind of the chain of events that happened someone who obviously you know this was something that they didn't have experience in and it was something that happened very quickly and he panicked you know it's it's not someone that uh you know did this out of no having prior knowledge of what to do when they're in a situation like that so well and what's interesting about this and you can automatically see where this is going before i finish the story but like he testified in court, like he blacked out from rage and yeah. fear, thinking that this person was going to rape him. Yeah. Um, and um, he even said, like, I don't even know. I was just grabbing my wallet to strangle him. I think what's interesting about this for the gay panic defense in general mm-hmm. is that there were so many opportunities 
um, for it to have not gotten as bad as it did. Yeah. So I know, like, let's play devil's advocate here in a way that's not necessarily ever comfortable for a true crime story, but I want to make a point about this. There is a point, so say he, remember, he strangled him and it turned out that Marco was still alive. Yeah. Um, toxic masculinity dictates, and everybody's wondering, well, if he was still alive and he did try to rape you, why wouldn't you have, like, driven to the police station? Or why wouldn't you have, like, you strangled him and he's passed out, why wouldn't you run away? Mm. Or And I know they were on a rural road or whatever, so, like, the actions in someone's brain, like playing devil's advocate, because no one knows what happened in that car. Yeah. No one knows. Yeah. Um, uh, because they burned Marco's phone and got away. So you can't even see if Marco was looking at... Po- like, because you could even pull up the porn yeah. on Marco's phone to see if that was something that was happening. Or was Lawrence really on the DL? Yeah. And it was just, like, a love interest gone wrong. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. So you don't know. And so why wouldn't he have drove to the police station and say that this person tried to rape me? And the only exactly. thing I could think of is that in... Like, toxic masculinity dictates that we're not allowed to por- report rape, even yeah. if it's coming from another man, yeah. which is a true case there in the sense of, like, fear. Yeah. Um, it just, it's so, but killing a person because you're too afraid to report them trying to rape you is also way too far. Yeah. Way, way too far. Yeah, it definitely, like, I don't know, it... It definitely was him panicking and him reacting out of violence with both this case and the case that I talked about. Both um, perpetrators talked about how they blacked out before they did what they did. Yeah. And all of a sudden they came to and, and they were faced with a body, you right. know. So and we found out in the case that I talked about that the panic defense he was trying to claim was completely false. Right. So. Um, well, and what's interesting about that is he called, like, in one of the cases that I read recently, um, like, it seems like with the gay panic defense, they tend to tell someone. Yeah. They tell someone that they murdered someone. That they, they called yeah. his girlfriend and told yeah. them that he murdered someone. Yeah. I mean, with uh, one detail I left out of the case that I was talking about is his is the guy's brother saw him after he had killed um, her and uh, asked him, like, what's going on? And he just said, it's not good. Don't ask me any more questions about it. Yikes. So, I mean, essentially, his brother and father had known that something had happened on his property, but um, there was, you know, he couldn't really hide it because of the evidence that was on him. Yikes. Um, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's a, it's a really disgusting and horrible topic, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. Yeah. So on Wednesday, February 27th, 2013, police reports police reports corroborated that story showing that he was strangled to death by a wallet chain. Yeah. Lawrence claimed that he didn't initially plan to try to burn Marco's body, saying he bought 94 cents worth of gasoline to burn the cell phone and fearing authorities would track the phone to find him. Yeah. Um, prosecutors would say uh, that Marco didn't attack Lawrence. Hmm. Um and eventually, uh, Lawrence was charged with the murder of Marco. Yeah. Um, and then on March 12th, 2015, Lawrence was found guilty of the murder of Marco McMillan and sentenced to life imprisonment in the custody of the Mississippi Department of Corrections. And of course, he did appeal his decisions, and I'm not quite sure where those are at today. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing about that, though, that's really interesting is that the reason that the gay panic defense didn't work here, and it does work in some circumstances. It does, yeah. Is it wasn't even because it was premeditated. It was because of everything that happened after. Yeah. Like, they they showed, like they said, prosecutors said that Marco didn't even try to attack him. Hmm. Because it seems like he was off guard in some capacity. Yes, yeah. Like, and that makes it feel and so i'm i'm happy obviously in this case that the gay panic defense didn't get another one in their win column yeah definitely because he would have gotten a lesser sentence and it would have been reduced to something like manslaughter or yeah. you know um yeah that's that's troubling um so was there anyone that ever came forward after the fact that said that they saw i mean other than that one instance that they had seen him getting out of his car previously on another night mm-hmm. was there anyone yeah. else that could kind of confirm that they might have had another so, rel- so one of the stories i read which i could not find any more information about this mm-hmm. is that they went to they actually went to the bar like 2 weeks before all of this hmm. um they were at a bar together um and and it wasn't it didn't presume to be a date in any capacity like yeah. that 
so that's the only thing that was the only thing I was able to find mentioned. Yeah. It. Was there any mention of how they actually met to begin with? Mm mm. There wasn't actually any really there wasn't ties to it other than mm. the fact that most people would probably say that uh, Marco was just well known in the community. Yeah. Because of all the involvement and yeah, stuff. And so that's for sure. probably where it happened. Yeah. And then as queer people, like we can actually dive into this a little bit. The um in any kind of spotlight, it's actually really difficult to have relationships with people um, in queer circles, especially if you're running for office or whatever. And oh, there's for a lot, sure. Like, it's not even a political scandal. Like, taking someone down a rural road to, like, get busy um, is not kind of unheard of. And it's not no, seedy and it's, it's not, not necessarily I shady. mean, it's something I've done. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> tea, something involved. It's must something be real. that a lot of queer <laughs> people have done. Yeah. And it, and it gets old and it gets, un- um, it, and it gets uncomfortable because we just can't feel safe enough being out yet. And of course yeah. we'll get there someday, but that, um, obviously didn't happen in this case and it's no. terribly, terribly sad. Yeah, um, especially since he had such a promising future ahead of him, mm-hmm. too. You know, he was someone who was getting involved in... He could have been someone, eventually, that would have been a great leader, not, you know, an out leader, too, for in a, in a rural community that mm-hmm. didn't really accept that identity a whole lot. Well, and I also think about the fact that Lawrence was 22 years old. Mm-hmm. Now, when I read true crime, I always... So this is actually what's kind of interesting about uh, writing a true crime story. Yeah. Was... Or telling a true crime story was the fact that... Retelling. The, retelling. Yes. The age... The age hit me differently than what I've heard when I listened to it on other true crime podcasts. Yeah, because he was uh, 12 years younger than him. Yeah, like my drag daughter is the same age as Lawrence. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I can imagine a 22-year-old flipping out at a 34-year-old my age. Yeah. Um... It, when you push something too hard. Yeah, more reactive, definitely, mm-hmm. you know, doesn't have the emotional maturity that someone your age right. would have. Well, and then dating someone, Lawrence was dating someone in their 40s. Yeah. And um, and part of this story, which I kind of left out, but not really, is, so he first went to her house, like, mm-hmm. after, after, like, leaving Marco's body by that barbed wire. Yeah. He actually went to his girlfriend's house and she wouldn't let him in the hmm. first time. Yeah. And so he left. I don't. And he drove around for a while. Hmm. And then he came back. And that was after he had called her and told her what had happened. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think her sister was there, or a friend or a sister mm-hmm. was there. And then when he came back and knocked on the door again and whatever, and she was like, "No, like, yeah, no, that's yeah, you just killed someone. Yeah, absolutely not." Um, and then he left, and that's when he got into the car accident, obviously. But it's just. I keep thinking about the weight of the world from a 22-year-old's perspective, and all of that is incredibly heavy. Yeah. Dating someone twice your age, also there's something to be said there, and then maybe being on the DL with somebody who was roughly 14 years older. And then I, there was an interview, and I, I don't know how this person was related to Lawrence, but they actually said, to the interviewer asked, could Lawrence have been gay? Mm-hmm. And she's like, mm, no, no, he, no. <laughs> mm. is what that's how she said on the interview yeah and it might have been his sister i'm not quite sure who it was in the interview but yeah just but that's the thing though like people can hide queerness people can hide a lot yeah people can hide a lot so it's yeah that's hard yeah and in lawrence's family was distraught and obviously just terribly upset because when you think about once again 22 year old who was on trial for murder yeah um like and all of this information coming to light. And he did confess um, to two different officers. Yeah. A taped confession and everything. Like, he he did these things. Yeah. And he took someone's life so early and so young. I'm 34. I feel like I'm real young. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the, the op- autopsy did confirm that um, Marco did die from the strangling and not the, not the drowning in the shallow water, right? I, don't know. I actually, hmm. I never looked at like a coroner's report or yeah. an autopsy report. Um, I'm assuming it actually happened from the drowning because mm-hmm. the reason he went to drown him is because he heard him making He heard noises. him, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that's where it happened. Hmm. Um, wow. So the guilty verdict was given in March of 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there, so uh, Marco's godfather, his name is Carter Womack said Marco's death was a loss not only to the family and friends but also the entire Clarksdale community yeah and with somebody that connected and somebody that involved that's just it's heartbreaking in so many different avenues yeah and I do want people to remember that um 
we we told these stories these last two weeks about the gay panic defense because um we need people to just know that people are trying to use this as a way to hurt and kill and murder queer people. It's still legal in the current state we live in, too. Yeah. It's it, not in Colorado anymore, the state that we moved from. But in Oregon, you would think, you know, having mm-hmm. uh, having Oregon be a, a blue state and li- especially living in the, you know, the blue liberal mecca that we live in, that would be something that would be pushed for. But no, the right. trans and gay panic defenses still are accurate defenses for to use um in the state of oregon yeah as long as that's a shame and so i did some research because i wanted to know what it actually meant Mm -hmm. and so it says traditionally the lgbtq plus panic defense has been used in three ways to mitigate a case of murder to manslaughter yes so lessening it obviously or justifiable justified homicide yeah number one defense of insanity or diminished capacity Uh, Mm -hmm. The defendant alleges that a sexual proposition by the victim due to their sexual orientation or gender identity triggered a nervous breakdown in the defendant, causing this panic. Hmm. The defense is based on the outdated psychological term gay panic disorder, which uh, was debunked by the um, American Psychiatric Association. Hmm. Number two, defense of provocation. The defense of provocation allows the defendant to argue that the victim's proposition, sometimes termed a non violent sexual advance was sufficiently provocative to induce the defendant to kill the victim. So let's just say that again. Yeah. <laughs> like a non-sexual, it, non-violent sexual advance was sufficiently prov- um, provocative to induce the defendant to kill the victim. That, that, uh, I can never see how a non-violent sexual advance is provocative enough to, to be like, to warrant being murdered. That like, means like any woman who ever got cat, because that's non-violent. Yeah, it a is. Wom- any woman who's ever been catcalled yeah. could go over and stab you in the throat. What, <laughs> like, well, what? and here's the shitty thing about this, is it's making it worse for gay people to express themselves in this way mm-hmm. than, it, than it always has been for heterosexual men to do it. Mm-hmm. So if a gay person is to act on on who they find attractive and and make mm-hmm. an advance mm-hmm. that isn't violent, you know, like that's saying. I mean, it's it's making it more perverted. It is. It's, it's making it because it, it does. It's a um, on its own. It's not illegal or harmful, but it's only yeah. considered provocative when it comes from an LGBTQ plus individual. Gosh, it's a very archaic defense oh, when you look whew. at it in this way. Yeah, and yeah. so the third and final is defense of self defense. Yeah. Defendants claim they believed that the victim, because of their sexual orientation or gender identity or expression, was about to cause the defendant serious bodily harm. Hmm. This defense is off. Um, this defense is offensive and harmful because it argues that a person's gender or sexual identity makes them more of a threat to a uh, threat to safety. It almost weaponizes them. It weaponizes your sexual orientation as a yeah. threat to safety. And then in addition, the LGBT plus panic is often employed to justify violence when the victim's behavior falls short of serious bodily harm standard, or the mm. defendant uses a greater amount of force than reasonably necessary to avoid danger, such as using weapons when their attacker was, un- was unarmed. Mm. So thinking about it this way, what this is actually, like Donna's right, but what it's actually saying bare bones is um, your sexual orientation is such a threat. Because remember, there are times when somebody uses physical force and can get off yeah. when they're like, did you feel like you were threatened? Yeah. Well, yeah, like um, he had a knife and even though he seemed like he was joking, I thought he might hurt me. I pushed him, he fell down the stairs, he broke his neck. Yeah. Like, And they're like, oh yeah, I saw the camera, like he was holding it up. Um, even though he's laughing, it kind of, I could see how you felt like you were threatened. Yeah. They're literally saying that the guy holding the knife is equates to sexual orientation yeah. existing in the world. Yeah. Like, I felt so threatened by the fact that this person was gay that I pushed them down the stairs and they broke their neck. I yeah. Don't, it just it's freaked so, me out. Oh my gosh, it's so archaic. I can't believe that it still <laughs> is an adequate defense in some states. I know, and it's, it's disgusting. And I've never, I'm glad I looked that up because I was like, I always just thought it was the shock uh-huh. of not knowing. But literally that last one is the most offensive thing in the world. Yeah. That your existence is a threat to society. Yeah. Um, loving another person is a threat to society and someone's well-being. I can't believe that. It's... Yeah. It's 
Very, very gross. Yeah. So um, we'll post pictures to our website. Um, that is officially the end of my story. How did I do, Donna? You did great. Thanks. Yeah, no, so it was really good. It was really good. I think, um, like we said, we're going to be doing this for a couple more weeks. And um, we've also discussed even doing true crime maybe once a month in the future, um, depending on the response from everyone, uh, if, yeah. they, if they like this. So um, thank you again for listening to another true crime edition of A Gem of a Secret podcast. Yeah. Um, my name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. And we will catch you next week, listeners. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. This has been another episode of A Gem of a Secret podcast. The hosts of A Gem of a Secret podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Gem Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at The Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a J E M of a secret podcast.com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye.